Cool. So I'm going to just start off in a prayer, and then I'm going to go right at it. Uh, dear God, I just pray, ho- just Holy Spirit, just empower me, um, help use me to uh, speak life into uh, this group that uh, you've entrusted uh, us with and that we've all gathered together. Yes, Holy Spirit, I just pray for more of uh, your empowerment, more of your anointing uh, here in this place. We just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I wanted to just share is if, if you don't know, our group is a, uh, a life group church. It is a, and if you don't know what life group is, it is our small group. And uh, for people who've been here for a while, we've traditionally called it cell group. And I wanted to let you guys know that if, you, if, if you've been on the email list for our, our life groups, you'll know that we, this week we changed it to life groups. And if you were part of one of the life groups, they've Um, probably many of the life group leaders made that announcement. So I just wanted to let the congregation know um, that we made that change and hopefully with that change, the, it's more intuitive on what the group is for. Really, we come together and we live life together uh, through the ups and downs, through the good and bad. Um, God calls us to live in community with one another. And, you know, the point is that there's going to be life that comes out of these groups. And it gives you just more freedom to do what you feel like God has called you in your group to give you that freedom to do what you need to do to create life. Um, and, you know, that means that each group will be different and it might be unique, uh, but God will work in each of those groups to continue to uh, bring all of us closer to him. And I'm really just yeah, excited about that. So if, some, if you guys have not been a part of it, uh, I've encourage you guys to go check it out. You guys can always find more information uh, at the newcomers booth, and they can give you all about the details about where we meet. Um, and it really, um, that's another thing is that that's where a lot of the getting to know people and the accountability happens. Because I know sometimes in a group like this, it's kind of hard sometimes to meet people, you kind of come and go, but it's in these smaller groups that you really get to meet the other people in the congregation, and you really get to live life with them. Um, I, I heard this acronym. I thought it was pretty cool. It's a pretty goal to strive for. Uh, but some, some, I, this is secondhand information. Someone told me that someone thought of this acronym for Life Group as living in fellowship every day. And I thought that was uh, great, something you know, really great to aspire to, that we can continue to live in fellowship every day. Um, and so I, I also just wanted to share with Hebrews 10, 24, 25 about when we live in community together. It says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day coming. And I really like this scripture because it tells us that when we meet together, we spur one another on, right? We encourage one another towards love and good deeds. And it's a really just a great scripture to show the importance of community and why we need to live in community God himself uh, is, you know, three persons in one, you know, the Trinity. He lives in a community relationship with himself, too. So it's just something that is, that goes through, like, you can say the, all of Christianity, this theme of living in relationship and community with others is very prevalent. So, cool. Um, so I wanted just to give you that quick update uh, for people who are uh, wondering, oh, you know, there's, there's been a change, and that's, uh, that is the change. So I hope you guys are excited about that. Hopefully I'll see you guys as I, you know, when I visit life groups, I'll be able to see and meet a lot of you guys there. So I wanted to continue. Um, I don't know if you guys were here before in the previous weeks that I was preaching, but I did talk about spiritual blindness. Okay. So I think in the previous weeks when I was sharing about it, I was sharing uh, how God kind of works in ways that we don't expect. Okay. And I kind of for a couple of weeks, I've kind of been preaching in, in, in that aspect of spiritual blindness. But today I want to talk about a different aspect. And it's interesting because uh, spiritual blindness, right, the word has spiritual in it. So you can't really talk about spiritual blindness without talking about some kind of spiritual aspect of it. And I don't want to say that I am the expert uh, of the spiritual realm. Um, and sometimes I'm thinking, you know, sometimes I'm thinking, like, because I'm not an expert in it, if I talk about it, maybe I'm opening a can of worms. You know, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I don't know if I, I don't know if you guys ever heard that expression. Like, and, but it is spiritual blindness. I want to at least share with what I felt about it and how I see it. And hopefully, as we go on this journey together, we all learn together 
uh, more about it. So when I'm speaking today, I hope you guys kind of uh, try to gather my intention. Sometimes the execution, the exact words may not be so precise, especially when you talk about something that's probably a little bit more spiritual, then sometimes it, the precision of words sometimes is a little harder to grasp. Um, because the Bible itself also sometimes is not always super clear like on how everything works. And it gives us principles, um, but maybe it's not going to be like a manual, like an exact instruction manual, like do this, do this, do this. Uh, and also, if, if you're wondering, seminary doesn't, at least to the point that I've been in seminary, they don't actually even really teach about it that much. Actually, most of seminary, if you've kind of even seen the way I've preached, is more about, um, it's almost like an ac academic study of the Bible. And so even a lot of the spiritual things, if you plan on going to seminary to learn more about that, especially in the Bay Area, you might not actually receive that much of it. So, so Ephesians 6, 11, 12, I wanted to start off with this. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So, you know, the first thing I gather from this is that there are uh, the devil, and he has schemes. Uh, happens in the spiritual realm. I think one of the things that, especially for us in the Western world, one of the things is, you know, and I've heard this, I don't know if you guys ever heard this, is that the greatest lie of the devil is to convince the world that he doesn't exist. And I feel like in the Western world, that is very uh, prevalent, that mentality. But it's interesting because I feel like when you go to other parts of the world, when you talk about God and the devil or angels and demons, people just assume that's true, right? People don't really question those facts. And actually, in the time of the Bible, when they wrote that in the Roman world, they had, you know, a, a multiple gods, so it was kind of an accepted fact that, hey, gods exist, and there's demons, there's angels. Yet, the Western world, we've continued to move, we kind of move beyond that, or we, we, we believe that that's not real. And I think it influences all of us on how we think, including myself. Right? So a lot of times, even for myself, I try not to think about it too much. Like, I'm like, oh, you know, that's just like something very spiritual, and it doesn't really impact my day-to-day. -day. You know, I just kind of, you just kind of put it on a shelf somewhere. But when I read this scripture, and when I was thinking about the spiritual blindness, I think that's one of the spiritual blindness, uh, not only myself, but maybe a lot of us here, is that we choose to like compartmentalize like our lives and be like, okay, that's like some spiritual stuff. It doesn't really impact us. And, you know, I just go to my day-to-day. -day, everything's fine. And so I think one of the things I've been trying to be more aware of is that, hey, there is something called, you know, if we believe in God, there's also something called the devil and that he does do schemes, even though we may not be aware of it. Um, you know, behind the scenes. And what I also like about this uh, verse is that it kind of reminds us that, hey, our spiritual warfare is not against, like, physical people. It's not against flesh and blood. Because I often feel sometimes we get, uh, we get caught up in fighting each other or fighting people. And we're like, oh, like, you know, I really need to, like, and we get really so angry at other people, right? Whether... Um, Sometimes it might be at work or at ministry or even when you're driving on the road and um, people might, their, 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 their mannerisms in driving is probably much different than your mannerisms and it causes a lot of conflict. That's like a very PC way of saying <laughs> road rage. <laughs> but it's a, when I read this scripture, it was a fresh reminder that, hey, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people. But there are some dark forces in this world in the spiritual realm that have control over like this world. And it's something, I'm not gonna say I'm an expert on how it all works, but I wanted to use this scripture to say, hey, this does exist. And it's something that we can't just ignore and pretend like it doesn't. And even though I'm not an expert in this, and maybe some people may be more of an expert than I am, I just wanted to like, help make me and also maybe for others to aware that, hey, this is something that the Bible does say, and it's not something we can just kind of gloss over and pretend it doesn't exist. So in this, if you read Ephesians even more, it does talk about putting on the full armor of God, and then it also then mentions about prayer. Uh, and so some, I, I'm not going to go over that today, but I wanted to talk about something that is similar to prayer. And for me, I'm like more of a practical guy. So a lot of times when I read this stuff, 
just my personality, I don't think of it so much as like, okay, there's a spiritual part, now what's the application part? And so for me, when I read this, it reminded me that, hey, there is something spiritual. What are some of the applicable things that impact the spiritual realm? So that's how I think, and maybe other people are different. But when I was reading the scripture, I was like, okay, what are the the things I can do to impact the spiritual realm? Because there is a spiritual realm, um, and this is what it came to me. It's similar to prayer. It uses the same body part as prayer. And it is with our mouths, right? We pray with our mouths. We also talk with our mouths. Our mouths have a lot of impact on the world around us. So I came to Proverbs 18.21. It mentions, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Proverbs 18.21, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So the scripture tells us that our tongue, what we say, has the power of life and death. We know this is probably, this is not physical death, right? Like, I, I won't say, I literally, if I say, you know, if I say, Bob, die, you know, he's not going to die, right? So we know it's not like your mouth does not physically bring death, right? But what it's saying is that, hey, there is a spiritual power behind what you say. And, it, and this spiritual power can bring life or death. And we know that... Things that happen in the spiritual realm does have some kind of impact on the physical realm. So when we pray to the Lord, right, it's a spiritual aspect that we're doing. We're praying to God, but then it has a physical impact on what actually happens. That's why we pray and things happen. Now, I'm not going to say I understand the whole mechanism of how it happens. You know, I don't know if you're asking me like a scientific way of like, oh, what does this prayer actually do to God to make this? You know, I might not know, but I know in my more simple-minded, uh, you know, I'm a simple-minded person, is you, you pray in the spiritual realm, something happens, something physical happens. So what you say with your mouth, it has some kind of spiritual impact, and then it has some kind of physical manifestation. So if you speak life, you will eat its fruits, you will get life. You speak death, you will get its fruits, and you'll get death. And it's something I don't think all of us, including myself, is like aware, right? A lot of times we just live day to day and we never think so much about the things we say actually can have such a large impact, uh, including myself. A lot of times I will just also live day to day and not think too much like, oh, I, you know, that's not how nor- normally we think about what we say, that, wow, the things that we say can actually bring life and death. So now... I want to turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 45. It says, The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil, for it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So if you want an indication of where people are at in their current life, you just let them talk. If you're ever wondering like how other people are doing, just let them talk. If people are speaking evil things, that means it probably shows that the status of their heart is not going so well. And if they're speaking positive things, good things, it probably shows that the status of their heart is going pretty well right now. And something that I've also been continuing to be reminded of is that God has given us two ears and one mouth. And so it means that we should spend more time listening than speaking. And it's actually just a reminder for myself because a lot of times now, even for myself, I'm in a position where I have to talk more. And after a while, you get used to talking. And then you just catch yourself, oh, I'm just talking a lot because you get used to it. And even for myself, I have to remind myself, hey, Jason, you talk too much sometimes. (laughs) Like when people come to you, they just want you to listen. They're not looking to you to always be talking or trying to find a solution. A lot of times people just want you to hear what's going on in their life. So, you know, these are the, I started thinking about more like, okay, it's very important, like what we say, including myself. And I think, you know, one spiritual blindness that I had was, to a certain degree, I started forgetting that. I started forgetting that, like, what I said was important. Because a lot of times we don't think of ourselves as important. We don't think of the things that we say have an importance. And even for myself, sometimes I became, sometimes I feel like, oh, you know, I need to be more aware of the words that I'm saying. And I think about, like, how important words actually are. 
and what we say. Probably all of us had some kind of words spoken over us as kids, and even to this day, it has some kind of large impact in our lives, whether we want to admit it or not. Like all of us, when we were like little kids, who thought that as a little kid, someone said something to you, 20 years later, you still remember it, and you, if it was a good thing, then like it's made you like super secure in your identity. And if it was probably something very negative, it was probably something super, it has made you kind of super insecure about your identity. And when you think about it, like, wow, even as little kids, some small thing that someone says has that power of life or death over you, even 20 years later as a full-grown adult. And so I wanted to share, uh, you know, I'll share with you guys, for me, you know, there's two things, you know, even to this day it has an impact on me. And it made me realize, like, oh, man, hey, wow, that, like, even things that people have said over me like 20 years ago like still have an impact on who I am today. So one of the, I'll start off with negative, right? Uh, I don't know why. I just, personality, I guess, just start off with negative first. You know, one of the things you guys have probably never seen me do on stage is like sing. Right? Even when the worship team, I've actually had the worship team tell me like, hey, just come on stage, take over, tell us what to do. And I would never do it. And I just, oh, no, it's cool, it's cool. And I've never actually shared this story before because I always thought, you know what, it's not a big deal. Who cares? But as like, you know, sometimes when people keep encouraging me to, oh, come on stage and say, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Like, what's holding me back? And I remember, you know, 20 years ago when I was growing up, I was in a smaller church. And I remember at the time, you know, when you sing for the Lord, you don't really like care what other people think, right? You just sing for the Lord, whether good or bad. And I remember someone made a comment that to some effect that like I suck at singing. And I think just ever since then, I kind of just, just kind of stopped. I was like, well, you know, I'm, I didn't sing for other people anyways, so who cares? I'm just going to sing for the Lord. And it's interesting. I think subconsciously it made it worse because this person actually was really good at singing. And later on, she became kind of like a semi-professional, like, pop singer, like, in Taiwan for, like, a summer. So I knew she was really good. Then later on, as I grew older, I kind of realized that, like, maybe she was saying that because also maybe, you know, sometimes, like, younger people, when they like someone, they tease you. So maybe that might have been it, too. I don't know. I try to rationalize positively. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Woo! But it, it just really did stick with me, even, like, 20 years later. And... I was thinking, you know, how many of us also have something like that that's happened in our lives? But on the flip side, you know, positive things, you know, one thing that my, when I was growing up and even to when I was an adult, my mom would always tell me that I was a good boy. And that has helped me to have the confidence to keep going forward even when I'm by myself or when I'm alone or when I feel down about myself because I always remember, oh, my mom always told me I was a good boy. Even if other people may not think that I'm good, but my mom, who knows me since the very first day I was born and knows me the most completely and intimately out of everybody in this whole world, says I'm a good boy, then I must be a good boy. And that has always given me the courage and the conviction to keep moving forward, even though oftentimes other people uh, may not be on board. And so I think about it like, you know, those are like the small things that were said over my life that had, has such a big impact. And in this case, that word overseeing has kind of brought like almost a death to it, to me seeing. But who knows, you know, as a congregation, now that I've shared this, and actually this is the first time I think I've ever shared that story, that who knows, maybe you might start seeing me sing up here. And we'll see how, you know, if she was right or not. <laughs> but also on the flip side, that when someone does say something good, it literally carries for your, the rest of your life. So then I think, you know, what are the aspects that we speak? There are three, three, relation, three relations that we speak into. There is how we speak to God, how we speak to ourselves, and how we speak with other people. So I wanted to go with how we speak with God. You know, there's two ways I can think of, we, you know, we speak to God in worship and we speak to God in prayer. And when it comes to worship, I don't know if you guys, I don't know how to explain it. But there is something very powerful in this, and you can feel it in your spirit when we all come together and we like worship together and we sing together. 
I don't know how to explain it, but just something feels very different. And it's, I just know it's something that I don't feel anywhere else. It really changes the spiritual atmosphere. It's like a spiritual posture. It really does make a difference when you speak out the words. It's like a spiritual posture of humility. When you, you know, I know not everyone is like this, but for even raising your hands, you know, why we do that is like an act of surrender. It's saying, hey, you know, I, I don't raise my hands for really anybody. But when it comes before the Lord, I, I raise my hand because I, I remind myself as a spiritual posture, Lord, I really surrender my life to you. I don't surrender my life to, uh, a, you know, I don't, to a pop singer or to a company or to anyone. I only surrender my life to you. And I do it in acts of submission by singing out loud and by raising my hands. It's different than just thinking in your heart. And I think you can also say the same thing without prayer. When you pray out loud, it's different than when you just kind of pray in your heart. Oftentimes I feel like when I pray in my heart, I just fall asleep. <laughs> but when you pray out loud, it really is like you, an act of submission. You're really like putting the effort in saying, God, I, what I'm saying is not just thoughts, but I'm not just talking the talk. I'm walking the walk. I'm actually putting action behind. I really believe that what I pray does something. You know, and, and I think in an aspect how God has been changing the way I pray, because I'm just like everyone else. A lot of times when I pray, I bring up to God, like, God, please do this for me. Please help me with this. I need help. I need help. Please help me. I feel like the Lord's asking, Jason, instead of coming to me and saying, do this, do that, the posture is, hey, God, Father, what do you want me to do? Right? It's a different attitude. I ask God, Father, what do you want me to do? Because I know your ways are higher than my ways. But oftentimes we approach the Lord thinking our ways are higher and we tell him what to do. And so something I've been trying to do is more like, God, what do you want me to do? Right? Even Jesus in John 5, 19 says, Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. So even in Jesus, he gives the example that he does what the father is doing. And is that the posture that we go before the Lord? God, what are you doing in my life? Let me be a partner with that. So then I also wanted to see, how do we speak to ourselves? I think maybe because of a lot of us, because of our upbringing, we might speak to ourselves or look at ourselves in a very negative light. Um, so here, I'm going to do a simple exercise, okay? See if, see if this works. I thought of this. Uh, so find somebody to, your, to the next to you. All right. If you're if not exactly, um, try your best to find somebody next to you. I want you guys, we're going to just spend a minute, okay? I want you guys to tell the person next to you something positive about yourself and something negative about yourself, okay? So just introduce someone next to you uh, and, say, and just tell them something positive about yourself and something negative about yourself. Okay, I'll give you guys a minute. All right. Does everyone have enough time to share at least one positive, one negative? No? Okay, I'll give you guys 30 more seconds. Okay. Cool. So with that simple exercise, 
Which one was easier? Was it easier saying something positive about yourself or something negative about yourself? Oh, okay. <laughs> you must have had a, a very strong mother to tell you you're a good boy all the time, too. In general, I, I, I'm assuming, okay, I'm assuming for most of us it's probably easier to think of something negative to say about ourselves. Or is this a false assumption? Silence means consent. So, uh, no way, okay, that turned out wrong. Okay, turn around. Sorry, I know it sounds different. I think in debate, when I, I used to be in debate, that's how like, we talk, like when you make debate arguments. Okay, sorry. I know now it means a totally different thing. My apologies, my apologies. Totally different thing. Okay. Yeah, and I just want to use this simple exercise to say, hey, for most of us, it's easier for us to say um, something negative about ourselves because we're more critical. Just like when I was sharing earlier, it was just easier for me to say the negative thing about myself than the positive thing about myself. You know, but in the Bible, it talks to us that we should, you know, that in Psalms 139, verse 14, it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You know, David mentions that he knows full well that he is fearfully and wonderfully made. Do we know that? That we are made full well? That God has made us fearfully and wonderfully made? Do we see ourselves in that way? Do we speak in the way that God sees us? You know, one thing that you know, I, I realize it's like a recent thing. I guess I never thought about it, but I guess for a lot of people, your height matters. <laughs> I didn't know, you know, I, I guess maybe I just, so I'm 5'6", okay? Probably, actually, technically, I'm 5'5 five, five and a half, okay? So I round up, I'm 5'6". And I never knew that for a lot of people, how tall you are really makes a difference. And so I think I'm considered probably on the shorter end uh, for a guy. I don't know, I'm just projecting here that I might be on the shorter end. And I know for, for some people, that is not the ideal height for a guy, especially if people are looking for significant others. Usually, right, they're looking for someone taller than them. That never, but that never, like, bothered me. And I never really thought about that in that way because I always thought to myself, you know what, if I'm five, five and a half, or five, six, then that, that's the way that God wanted me to be. And that's how come you probably never hear me talk too much about my height or feeling that I'm too short I always feel like, God, that's exactly the way that you wanted me to be, right? Because puberty happened. I could have, there's a wide range, but God wanted me to stop at this exact point. <laughs> there must be a reason. And I often think, you know what? If I was any taller, uh, you know, I'd probably be too proud. So God keeps me humble. Uh, But I want to say that, hey, do you see the way that God has made you? Or are we, you know, do you see yourself in a, in a different light? And you're always negative about yourself. And that's just an example, like, hey, you know, God made you this particular way. There's a reason for that, that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know that full well? And last but not least, I just want to talk about how we speak to one another. It says, iron sharpens iron, in Proverbs 27, verse 17 to 18. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So when we speak to one another, we speak life and death into one another. We help one another grow. And it's good to like, have people that you trust to give you feedback. It helps you grow. I'll give you an example. You know, two weeks ago when I spoke, I got a feedback about, you know, the words that I use. And it was very, it's good because I get to hear, like, you know, people helping me become a better speaker, a better preacher, so I don't misuse my words. And so the feedback I got last time was that maybe it, uh, you know, when I was asking for God wanting, wanting more of God, you know, probably some people thought that, there should be a reference to maybe like reading the Bible or praying more, spending time with God, but instead I kind of refer to kind of as a specific list of tasks, which made it, made it sound like I was using my, my platform to like, you know, be uh, 
passive aggressive to like a few people, right? Hopefully this is not considered passive aggressive. Is this considered passive aggressive? No. No. <laughs> I thought about that, but okay, really my intention is not to be, okay, it's not, it's not to be. I just wanted to clarify that, hey, the intention was that, you know, I agree that reading the Bible, praying more, spending more time with God is how you get the more, is, one, is a way that you can get more of the presence of God in your life. But I think the main point, what I was really trying to say is that you have to put God first above all things. Because even if you pray more, read more, spend more time, if you don't put God first, it just becomes a religious chore. And so I think the the most important thing is that you're making sure that God becomes the center, and we do all these things because we want more of God. And I, I, I use like more practical examples or more tasks because it's just something more applicable, uh, something that, um, yeah, more relevant maybe to the group. Uh, yeah. So just, just a funny thing is like, because I remember I got a, you know, just you guys, you guys can go on vacation, okay. I just want to make sure. I got, okay. I got someone kind of joking around like, oh, I mean, I can't go on vacation or something. Uh, no, you can go on, I'm going on vacation too in, in, in a couple weeks to visit my family in, in Asia. Thank you. It's because, you know, I know I'm putting God first. God wants me to honor and value my family, so I'm going to go visit my family. But the whole point is that you put God first in all the things that you do. So hopefully this makes things better. I, hopefully this explanation doesn't make things even more convoluted. But that's the whole point I was trying to say. You guys get what I'm saying? Okay. So I just want to know that, hey, feedback is a good thing. I know a lot of times our initial reaction is that we get sad. There's two reactions to it. You either get sad or you get mad. That's usually the two initial reactions. But I just want to encourage you guys to get past that and to think, hey, you know, especially when a good friend tells you something, you know, iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another. Last, I wanted to leave with this is Ephesians 5.4. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse talk, joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. You know, how do you know if you go too far uh, with your joking or your foolish talk? You know, really only the Holy Spirit knows. The Holy Spirit, <laughs> the Holy Spirit will convict you. But I think what was really interesting is last week, Pastor James mentioned that about himself, how he used to joke a lot, and the Holy Spirit convicted him that it was too much, even though his friends were encouraging him. So I don't want to say black and white exactly what is too much, but the Holy Spirit will convict you. And it's interesting because when he shared that, I know for some of you guys it might be hard to see, but I, also, I was like that too. I'm much more PC now, but when I was in high school, I also said a lot of bad jokes too. And... Also, in a similar state with, the, with Pastor James, I think the Holy Spirit convicted me too that some of these jokes are, are not appropriate. Right? And it's interesting, this verse it ends with, but rather thanksgiving. So today I just wanted to end with thanksgiving. It is also Thanksgiving weekend coming up. And I wanted to share something. I know a lot of times we're very critical of ourselves. And so I wanted to, and even for myself, I'm trying to learn more to be more, to be more, um, to say words of encouragement to people. Because I think even for myself, I just kind of assume, oh, that's, okay, you know, they know they did a good job. So they, you know, why do I need to say that they did a good job? Because they know they did a good job. But I realized that, like, even for myself, I, I need to open up more and share people with words of encouragement. So today I just wanted to end with words of encouragement for you guys and what you guys mean to me. You know, I think of, I was thinking about the words I can say about you guys as Ignite. And the thing I can only think about when I was, when I was thinking about this is that I'm just really proud of you guys. Kind of like how a parent is proud of their kids. Um, I feel like Ignite is something I'm more proud of than all my academic accomplishments, all my career accomplishments. And I was thinking, you know, the reason why I'm so proud of you guys here is not because you guys, like, are really accomplished or really great, because I know some of you guys are really accomplished and really great, but I really just believe that you guys are really good people. I feel like if you want to find some of the best people ever, Ignite is one of the places that you can come to find those people who are genuinely just good people, and they're honestly here just to serve God and they're very selfless with their love, and they serve one another very selflessly. 
And I feel for me, that's what I'm most proud about for this group. You know, for our group, we continue to, people, you know, it's very hard. I don't know if you guys feel that way or not. Where, where else can you find like a hundred or so young professionals and college students, like in the prime of your life? For a lot of us, it's like what people consider the prime of our life. We choose to stay here at an immigrant church and we choose to help out everywhere when people need help. And I, when I really think about that and the heart that people have here for this church and for God's kingdom, I'm really just really touched. I'm really honored. I'm really proud of like everyone here. So if the worship team, we're going to go into a time of response. And we're going to have prayer partners here for you as well. When we go into a time of response today, I was thinking, let's just sing to the Lord. Let's, use our, let's be in a posture where we just declare the goodness of God, that we just use our mouths and declare, like, God, you know, whatever the lyrics that is going to be put on, like, God, you are. Because I know a lot of times there's this tendency we, we kind of just hold it in. But today I just want to encourage Let's create that spiritual atmosphere. Because the spiritual atmosphere does change when it comes to when we speak out in our posture. So wherever you can, just get comfortable. And we're going to just spend this time of response just together as a group to sing out loud to the Lord and to praise him and to worship him. And if you need any prayer, we're also going to have prayer partners here in the front for you as well. Dear God, I just pray thank you, God, for for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for, thank you for fearful, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you for being the life giver, that any time that we connect with you, Lord, we know we're gonna have more life. We're gonna have more life abundantly. Thank you. Thank you. We just want to spend this time, Lord, just to, to sing your praises, to say how good you are, how wonderful you are. In Jesus' name.